Influence isn't just about making a name for yourself, it's about making a statement. On that score, TV writer and producer David Simon is second to none. Simon is best known for creating the HBO hit The Wire, which ran for five critically acclaimed seasons in the mid-2000s. His other shows include Treme, Show Me a Hero, and most recently The Deuce, starring James Franco and Maggie Gyllenhaal. Simon won an Emmy in 2000 and has been nominated for many more since. He's here to talk about how streaming has rocked the television industry and how to use your work and life to say things that matter. Hello everyone, I'm Andy Serwer and welcome to Influencers and welcome to our guest David Simon, award-winning showrunner, producer, creator, reporter, TV shows including Homicide, The Wire, Generation Kill, Show Me a Hero, Treme, and now The Deuce. David, great to see you. Glad, glad to be back. So, um, I know you have a new show, we want to talk about that, but The Deuce is on right now on HBO, so let's start by talking about The Deuce. Um, the final season right now, season three. So what were you trying to say here with the deuce? Um, we backed into a story about the rise of pornography, um, legal pornography in American life. Uh, we didn't want to do a porn show. Um, and we got dragged into a room with a guy who had been uh, at the center, uh, the center of basically the world of Times Square from the uh, early 70s on. And after listening to the stories for a while, uh, my co-writer and I, George Palkanis, um, we excused ourselves from the meeting after a couple of hours of listening to him, and we took a walk around the block. We pretended to go smoke a cigarette, though neither one of us smoked, and, and we looked at each other and we said, my God, we have to do a porn story. Um, it was a labor story. Um, I don't know that that, I don't think he knew what he was telling us, but what we were hearing was, this is a story about um, unencumbered capitalism and what happens when uh, labor is not only devalued, but, but labor is in effect the product itself. Um, and uh, the idea of sex work as um, allegorical for a lot of what ails us as a society uh, started becoming evident. And so we had a chance to do that. And then the trick was, um, can we do this with compelling characters? Can we, um, can we find a narrative structure that works, that captures that run of Times Square when it was the... Um, uh, when, when it was not what it is today, and you know, it was, it was no longer the Great White Way. It was, uh, I would say, from 1970 to 1985 was probably the heyday. So those are the three seasons covering that period. Right. And uh, and we're coming to the end of the run, and um, we're pretty proud of it. Um, you know, a lot of people when they encountered it as an idea, they thought, man, this sounds gratuitous. Um, but in fact, I think it, when it comes to things like sexual commodification and um, gender issues and, and uh, really um, downright misogyny. Um, I think this is some of the most grown-up stuff uh, we've ever gotten on in any of our shows. We're pretty proud of it. So I just ticked off uh, a bunch of shows that you've done, and you know this one's different. They're all kind of different. Some of them are the same. Some of them are <laughs> more different than others. Yeah. And I'm wondering, you know, we're about the same age, hitting 60 and all that. You've got this body of work. Looking back at it, what, what does it say? Or do you think about your collective body of work? Yeah. I mean, you, 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 in the beginning, no. But as you start to get into a career of things, um, you start thinking, man, I only have so many years. What am I putting on the shelf? Um, and I mean, we tend to go to projects that, are, that we, you, you're not going to see them on TV unless we chase them. That's a, or even if you think you're going to see a cop show, you're not going to see a critique of, a drug, of the drug war within a cop show. Uh, even if we're um, doing what seems to be uh, a piece about a, a war, young men at war in, in Generation Kill, the critique of modern warfare, the, um, the, the political imprecision of it, um, the lack of forethought, uh, is not really what you see addressed in a lot of war stories. Um, so we're always chasing something with the premise of, man, if we don't make this, um, 
it's not going to get made. I mean, I think the ultimate example of that was we did a piece in Yonkers on, uh, on public housing policy and on why we're a hyper-segregated society. And um, six hours of housing policy in Yonkers, New York. I mean, you know, if not, you know, if we're not bringing that, I don't know who is. So, you know, if it's not out there, it has our attention in a weird way. So do your shows intentionally take a while to get into? Because I've, I've tried to get, for instance, some of my daughter, for instance, younger people, and sometimes they have a harder they time They don't drive in, in the beginning. Yeah. No, they're like, they're, they're... Why is that? Well, I mean, we, you know, from going back to The Wire, uh, but even The Corner, I guess, um, we were... I come from the world of, of narrative nonfiction, of prose writing. Uh, and I wrote a couple books, and, and I'm, I'm aware of what the first chapters of a book are supposed to do. Um, they're probably not what a hit television show is supposed to do. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, you're looking at somebody who's had a 20-year run not having an audience. So, you know, if, if, you're, if you're looking for somebody to explain to you how to have a successful television show, you're looking in the wrong place. Well, um, and I'm not being... quite right, but... I'm not being... I mean... What I'm looking for is when you get to the last hour of the show, the last 20 minutes of something that's run for, whether it's run for five seasons, three seasons, six episodes, when you look back at the first 10 minutes, the first 10 minutes make perfect sense in the way that um, in a good novel, um, the first chapters are there for a reason. You know, uh, you, you don't, you're not necessarily being given the full statement of theme. Characters aren't fully developed. Uh, the journey hasn't been stated in, in most cases. Um, but those first chapters are the beginning of world building and the beginning of um, a deliberation about character and theme and, 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 and content that when you look at what happens in those first paragraphs of a good book, um, choices were made and they make sense at the end. So if, you get, if, if I get you and you go all the way, then I think when you come back, you look at it, you say, this, be, this is resonant and I can watch this again if I want and I'm gonna see things I didn't, which we get a lot of rewatch. Um, but what we don't get is a mass audience going, man, this thing crackles from jump and I gotta see what happens next week. Uh, I'm pretty miserable with, uh, at doing that. That's, that's really interesting that there's the intention, but you're so right that you get drawn in in a way I think that other shows and don't draw you in. And it's, it's interesting that there's sort of a long, you're playing a long game. Uh, it, it, it's, yeah. you know, I mean, listen, I came up in TV, I learned on Homicide, which was episodic. It's an incredibly well-written episodic drama, but it was 22 separate episodes a season. It was, it was you know, you're, you're, you're chasing, you're doing Dubliners. You know, you're not chasing Ulysses. You know, you're, it's like, it's not a singular, it's a series of short stories um, tied together, tethered together with characters that more or less go on. Um, and what we're structuring here is, is singular stories over the course of a season or, in some respects, over multi-season. Right. So shifting gears a little bit, David, um, you've had this great run at HBO. Yeah. I want to ask you, what the heck's going on at HBO, new owner, AT&T? How are you feeling about things? What does the company look like? Well, it's all above my pay grade. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the truth is I'm out, you know, we, we've been shooting two things simultaneously uh, this last year. Uh, prepping it, shooting it. Now, now we're in post on the, the last one, and so I, I'm not, you know, I'm not hanging around the office. I don't have an office there, but I, I haven't, I haven't been in and out of meetings at the same rate I might otherwise. So I don't know. Um, I work for a phone company now that has. So bought, do I. That, right here, there Verizon you go. owns us. There right? you go. Yeah. So in the same boat. So um, they've been, as far as I'm concerned, they've been benign in the sense that I've encountered, you know, I'm on existing projects that were greenlit before. Uh, the, the, the truth will be next year, I'm gonna, I got stuff in development, we'll see what, what they want me to do, and then I'll know, as, as somebody who's been a vendor there since 98. Everybody I started working with in 98, all the department heads, all the bosses, have turned over. Um, there's nobody, I can, I'm trying to think of anybody, the last, last few people were out the door this year. So, I'm looking around, same as anybody, you know. Yeah, it's a different world. So let me ask you about Netflix. And, you know, they've had an incredible run. And I remember, and you remember, when Jeff Buke, as the CEO of Time Warner, called them what, the Albanian Army or something like that, <laughs> disparagingly. And they sure ain't that anymore. Do you think they're going to continue to be successful? Yeah, I, I mean, listen, they, they're, they're flooding the market with content. Um, 
and I don't understand the model. But that's not that's not a rap on them. I don't understand the model. I'm you know I'm a you know long long time ago I, I went into journalism and I was a police reporter from Baltimore. So that I don't understand a mass communications model in the digital age is is no no great uh, insult to anybody. But I don't know the the revenue stream and how you get people to watch your content overall and where the money comes from eludes me. Um, and in some respects, it, it's not just Netflix. It, it does in every sense. I mean, I understood cable bundling. I, when I get to HBO, that seemed to be the, the lion's share of what they're doing. Now everyone's got their own platform. And how you pull people to that platform is either library or buzz or having a hit. And in some respects, Netflix is trying to do, I think, you know, really rely on the library model. Maybe they're right, but it, it seems like it's an incredible amount of production in terms of money. Um, I'm astounded by how much they're spending on, on content. And let me ask you about this sort of peak content issue. I mean, there's so many shows. You started out, there are you know, a few quality shows on TV, all at HBO, basically. Now, it's everywhere. It's so ubiquitous, pervasive. What does that say, and how sustainable is it? What is it like being a consumer of that? I, I don't know. I'm not much of a consumer of it. Like uh, People have to tell me, listen, I watched all three seasons of this. It was really good. They had a point. They knew where they were going. They got there. And then I'll, same as anyone else, I'll start streaming it. But I don't actually keep up with uh, the first season I mean, of is anything. there too much out there? Well, you know, I, I don't know how anyone's getting to all of it. And, and in some respects, um, I don't think anybody has to get to all of it. it how, you, how you sift through it is interesting to me. I don't know how you find the good. I mean, it's got to be word of mouth. It's got to be buzz. It's got to be the uh, critical acclaim, such as there's still an organized pool of critics, which has also, you know, been in some, in some way uh, abstracted. But looking at it, I just feel like it, there's so much more. But if you looked at the percentages of dross to quality, I think they're probably about the same as when there were three networks, you know, or three networks in Fox. I mean, I think there was... You know, there was an awful lot of bad TV before there wasn't uh, this, this, you know, vast diaspora of, of television drama. Um, I think probably there's more good and there's, there's, there's more mediocre. You know, yeah, it's interesting because people talk about, oh, the great shows on Netflix. But if you actually look at Netflix, the great shows are there. But then there's dozens, scores of other shows right. that you never heard of that aren't any good. And I mean... You know, not that it's helped me find a mass audience right away. I mean, I, again, usually people find our shows when they're um, when they're on the shelf and done. But um, but HBO, the one thing I've always been indulged by is they launch a show, the billboards go up, the promos start happening, the ads start running. You know, they they get behind the shows that they do do. If like if you're on the air, if they're putting you on the air, that means something to them. And they and they had a publicity dynamic that was. Right. Really aggressive, and you know, I look at you know some of what's happening with streaming now, and you know, Netflix will drop a show, and it'll be like, I didn't read, it. I didn't see anything. Yeah, right, you know, it's right. just like you know, they just they just drop them and find them if you will. You know, right. That's that's true. Um, tell us about the plot against America, which oh. is, of course, your new show based on a Philip Roth novel, yeah. where Charles Lindbergh, the aviator hero, becomes a fascist president of the United States. And I read that you talked to Roth about it, which sounds like an incredible conversation. I mean, he died in 2018. I had one meeting with the man, um, and it was for about an hour and 45 minutes, and it was um, it went well. But I, I mean, I have to say, I walked in, and I had the immediate sensibility that, oh my God, I just walked into Philip Roth's apartment. Oh my God, I'm talking to Philip Roth. Oh my God, you know, I just tried to make a joke. Oh my God, he sort of laughed, you know? Like, I, I yeah. really, like the first 20 minutes were taken up by me trying to get my head around the fact that, you know, I was having a meeting with Philip Roth. Um, because, again, one of the great uh, voices in American literature. And uh, it happened to be on the, um, well, it happened, on, it happened to be on the day after uh, they o awarded uh, the last Nobel for, um, for uh, literature. Uh, they skipped a year after that. Um, so, I remember I felt the need to say something because he had not won. It, it was an English writer, and uh, um, I felt the need, you know, being a guy from Baltimore who can't shut his mouth, I'll make a joke about it. And, and so I said, 
at, right at the door. I said, who's, who's this guy with your prize? And he, without missing a beat, he said, well, at least they didn't give it to Peter, Paul, and Mary because he was a year out from the Bob Dylan Award and he was, I don't think that made him happy. But um, he had very distinct ideas about certain things that shouldn't happen or should happen. He had a couple of casting choices that we you know, tried to honor, but it didn't work out for whatever reason. And he had some very precise notes about what the novel was and wasn't. They were very smart. And then I went, I was trying to um, get at least permission to play with a couple things, um, which I felt the need, because again, it's Philip Roth. So it was an interesting meeting all around. So obviously we're doing the piece because of Trump. Uh, you know, the idea of a, a demagogic populist who, um, you know, untethered from the old, you know, party system, um, who promise, has a simple fundamental message that appeals um, in the most basic way. With Lindbergh in that book, it's peace and prosperity. I'll keep you out of World War II. Uh, I'll keep you out of Europe, out of, Euro out of the next European war. Um, and a sense of the other in American life. In that, in that book, it's American Jewry, American Jews, that are the, um, um, the worrisome other that he uses as, uh, as, um, as kindling uh, for, um, for a dry run at, at, at fascism. And now we're, you know, there's a very simple message that, that Trump used effectively uh, to outrun the party system. And now there's, the other is people of color, immigrants, um, people who are not white, people who are not straight, people who are, um, you know, a little bit off of what uh, a previous generation of Americans might have called normal white America. You know, right. and all that all that, that phrase in, entails. So, there's a very there's a real reason to do plot against America now as a miniseries. On the other hand, one of the things uh, he said was, "Don't mistake Donald Trump for uh, Charles Lindbergh, because Lindbergh in his day was it was like Neil Armstrong times ten. Mm. You know, from having flown the Atlantic, the, being, being the lone eagle in that little plane, um, his sheepish." Midwestern looks, you know, he was beloved. And so he came in not with the cachet of being a reality TV star and, uh, and a casino owner um, or a real estate guy, but being a genuine American hero. So right. it, it, it gives you pause. I mean, what if, what if Trump actually had more charisma and more... More charisma. More charis yeah. charisma. Yeah, yeah. I, maybe it doesn't work on me, but yeah. I, feel like, yeah. I feel like he's paper thin. I mean, what yeah. if this guy really was adept mm, right. at, at, at wielding power. Yeah. Uh, the, the amount of damage that, a, you know, a demagogue can do. How did we, how did we get here, David? I mean, the political divisiveness, um, income and wealth inequality, President Trump, we're at this moment in time, aren't we? Yeah, I think, uh, I think truth has been devalued in the most incredible way. Um, you know, I come from journalism and journalism was effectively hollowed out and corporatized, and, and I think in some respects, it went off the books into social media. Um, the lies that you can effectively tell uh, as in a mass communications model, off the books on unregulated social media, go around the world three times before um, mainstream media can get its books on, can get its boots on. And uh, that's a new phenomenon. That's, you know, that's, you know, what if, what if Goebbels um, had had the capacity to sidestep even, you know, even the, uh, the world press on, on a daily basis, to completely sidestep the world press? Um, how much further might that message have traveled unimpeded? And we're in that point of, of, of untried, untested waters. Let me ask you about... Twitter and Facebook a little more. I mean, you have this love-hate relationship, though, with Twitter. You must. I mean, you're on Twitter. They've thrown you off. Yeah. And, right? then, and then I got back on to, just to yell at them. And, right. now, and now they haven't thrown me off again. I secretly hope they will, because right. they're like, you know. Like, yeah. But um, it, tw Twitter, to me, is just... I mean, you call them idiots. You say the people who run it are idiots. They are. Why? I mean... I, I mean, it's very complicated, but... Mm -hmm. 
effectively, what they choose to police is meaningless. And what they are incapable of policing because they have no, they have no newsroom. They have no ethical, you know, there's, there's no ethical strand that is tethered to truth as a value. Um, what they fail to police is ruining the world. Um, not just them, but, you know, Facebook and everything else. I mean, you know, the simple vulgarities and uh, obscenities or, um, you know, or, 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 you know, mere sarcasm uh, that they'll chase and run down with, with great vigor mean nothing. You know, but the idea that you can slander somebody or slander a cause or, or slander a whole people um, as a matter of routine, and that's fair comment, and doesn't need any uh, interpretation or any, any interposition. And I'm not even talking about censoring it. I'm talking about um, delivering uh, a definitive um, statement that this is false, as, as anybody at a mainstream news organization would um, or should. Um, it's, a, it's an incredible model for disinformation. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of nonsensical that there's nothing we can do about lying and fake things. And who are we to decide? I mean, it's right. just a platform. Right, right. right? We're, just, we're just a bulletin board. Right. Pay no attention to, to, yeah. to our role we, in we, No, we make a lot of money and we have incredibly high margins. Yeah. But, but you can post anything here. Right. It doesn't matter. You know, I mean, the, thing, the moment that I got thrown off, somebody was conjuring a ridiculous conspiracy theory utilizing the death of uh, a friend of mine, um, Tony Bourdain, mm. for a ridiculous conspiracy. And, and all I wanted to do was say, this is, this is an affront. This is a human affront, what you're doing here. And yet I was, I was kicked off for you know, making a light mother joke about some bot, about some bot's non-existent <laughs> mother, you know? Like, sorry, I can't right. get on there to actually address this because right. I have to apologize to a Russian bot <laughs> because I've said something naughty about his mother. Right, that's crazy. Such as his mother is. Right. Um, let me drill down a little bit more um, with regards to President Trump. I and mean, just very simply, do you support impeachment? Uh, I do, uh, on the same premise uh, that a lot of people are now saying it, which is whether it's successful or not, whether it's politically viable or not, there is an ethic of, of how you have to behave and, and what rules have to apply if the American Republic is gonna survive. If you say this doesn't merit the response of the other branch of government uh, mm. to assert for the Constitution and for what the Constitution says fundamentally, then that document's meaningless and the construct, the checks, checks and balances of the Republic uh, have been rendered moot. So whether you win or lose, you have to have a fight. I mean, uh, a hero of mine from when I wanted to be a newspaperman was uh, I.F. Stone. Um, and he had this great quote, I'll never forget it. He said, you know, sometimes the, fi the, the fights that you have that are the most important are the ones that you know you're not gonna win. Um, now, I don't know what the outcome of an impeachment inquiry is. You know, when, when they went in on Nixon in the 70s and Watergate, uh, when they began the inquiry, most people were against impeachment. By the time the evidence was laid out in front of the Irvin Committee, uh, American, uh, uh, the American populace had been transformed in their awareness of what, you know, how criminal that, that investigation had become in terms of the administration. So who knows what's going to happen. But let's assume that, you know, McConnell and the Senate bottles it up and it, it becomes a vote into nowhere. It nonetheless preserves the idea that there are standards, that, that the republic has to have standards and certain things have to be upheld and argued for. And if you stop arguing for them, they will cease to exist. So speaking of the 1970s and wanting to be a reporter, we grew up together. We did. And we're on the same high school newspaper together. The Tattler. Um, the Tattler, right, yeah. exactly. The Bethesda it sounds so inconsequential, yeah. but I like to think it was one of the finer high school papers in the country. Particularly at a certain point yes, in time. Yes, yes, certainly. Um, so <laughs> you always wanted to be a reporter. Do you ever put yourself on the couch and ask why? Uh, it's, you know, listen, my dad, was a journalism major at Columbia and had a brief fling with newspapers, Hudson County Dispatch, and, and then he ended up going into the Army, and when he came out, he had a kid, and he went into public relations, and it, like, never, he didn't have that feet up on the desk in the newsroom, you know, 
ink stained wonderment, you know, front page Hildy Johnson moment. But he, he, he definitely inoculated mm -hmm. uh, me to all of the, I mean, I was, uh, we, I grew up in a house with all the newspapers, Washington Star, Washington Post, New York Times on Sunday, all the magazines, and argument, argument, argument. You know, New Deal lefty Jews, you know, five of us at the dinner table, seven opinions. And that's how you got attention, that's how you got um, validated, was arguing current events and reading current events. So um, I think there was something inevitable about me going to the newspapers. Um, and uh, I, I, I had no cause to regret it until newspapers started running away from their own product. Right. Anyway. You had the, a, a great career at the Baltimore Sun. Um, Baltimore still, you, you lived there part time and you were recently defending your city from President Trump who was right. warring with Elijah Cummings. And yet, David, I looked at the Baltimore Sun, they have this graphic that keeps track of the murders there, which is mm. something you know so much about so well. And they've lost, they've lost control. 273 yeah. murders now, so we're on pace to get 300 murders a year again, mm -hmm. and the population's much less. So it's one what, of the most dangerous cities in America. What do you? What's? What can we do about it? What, what can well, I mean, there's. Let's be honest about it, um, the fact that there are two Americas, and one of them predominates in the imagination, which is to say, there's three places in America, where the the, the rules of post-industrial um, economics don't apply: New York, L.A., and Washington. They're, those are unique economies. New York is the world financial capital, the cultural capital of the country. 30, 40 year run up on Wall Street has you know, bricked over all of the ur problems of urbanity that the rest of America is dealing with. Um, this is one of the safest cities in America per capita. And you gotta, you gotta go way out into the outer boroughs to find trouble at this point. I mean, there's just so much money that it's become a playground for the rich. Washington is also a nerd because it's got the, the, the federal budget and the federal dynamic and the, the influx of you know, fresh money every four years. You know. um, it, Washington's economy is unique. And the west of L.A., I mean, I'm not speaking the east of L.A., but you know, the west, right. uh, you know, <laughs> west of the 101 is, um, is an industry that I've had a little bite of, which is uh, recession-proof. And, and San Francisco, too, the Bay Area. Yeah, we that's right. That that's, as well. that's right. right. I mean, yeah, I mean you, you have to go out way into the East Bay yeah. and start finding right. problems. And then you have all the rest of the cities, which are contending with uh, the post-industrial world. And some of them have found their way better than others. Um, and, you know, things have gone wrong in Baltimore that have to do with uh, economic choices made early on. Things have gone wrong in terms of um, the le level of drug use. It became predominant in this 1970s, heroin and then cocaine, and speedballs intravenous. It was, um, the levels of drug use were astonishing. They, they were, if you looked at the Dawn statistics, um, the, the levels of education in the city. It was a city that relied on those union jobs, on Beth Steele, on the port, on you know, a high school education, and you were set for life until you weren't. So it, it did not, you know, like Pittsburgh did, I think, did very well. The city near us did very well. Doesn't have the same levels of uh, undereducation and um, and drug drug abuse. And you know, Baltimore is having an existential crisis. But the other thing is, just on a practical level, the police department lost control. They um, it was badly led, and it was misused actually uh, by uh, politicians to fight the drug war to the last arrest. And when you do that, you actually forget how to do police work. And you know, to solve a murder, to prevent the next murder from happening, it's hard work. You actually have to do police work. And they taught a generation of cops just to go in guys' pockets and make right. money that way. Still, still have those problems. Um, speaking of politics, um, shifting back to the national scene a little bit, um, and the Democrats, um, are they shooting themselves in the foot? They look bifurcated, maybe going to the left? Any ideas on who you'd support or where you think I mean, things I, would go? I, I've, been, I've been speaking well with Warren for a long time now. Um, I, this, is, this is all I care about, which is, is um, I think it's important to choose who you want in the primary. The, the idea of like 
uh, gauging um, electability in the general election now mm. as a means of you know curtailing. Um, I think that has a bad effect on the Democratic platform. I think it I think it it drives you to places where. Um, uh, uh, ideas are being curtailed, argument is being curtailed, and I believe in that. I believe that primaries are a place for the better arguments to prevail. Um, and to that extent, somebody like Bernie, um, whatever you think of Bernie, uh, has deeply influenced um, the democratic uh, ideal of what of what is possible. Um, he certainly has made the word socialism plausible again on the American political spectrum. How plausible, I don't know. Yeah. But, but, but it's you know, you can say it. You can say it without uh, having to redefine yourself in the next sentence. Um, but I do get pissed off as a, as a lifelong Democrat who doesn't want another four years of, of this of this administration. If there's a way to do it to advance your own arguments, your own credibility, your own viability as a candidate, without tearing out the guy next to you um, or having your supporters tear out the guy next to you and not creating a path that is the inevitable path that the Republicans will then use against whoever gets it. You know, I, for Bernie to run against Hillary was grand. For Bernie to try to have his ideas and his candidacy prevail over Hillary was grand. For his supporters to transform her into something as, and not all of them did, but, but to have have the extremity of rhetoric get to the point where in order to exalt Bernie, she must be, you know, some rightist warmongering, you know, I mean, she's a, she was a centrist, right. center, somewhat left. She wasn't as progressive as Bernie by any means. You know, she was, um, there were plenty of reasons to critique her, but it was gonna come down to a binary choice between her and this nightmare. And I think there's something incumbent on all the Democratic candidates to leave um, that fundamental choice standing and credible at the end, no matter who wins. And so I sort of attend to, you know, if, if I see somebody savaging somebody else more than advancing their own arguments, I'm, I, I, I get alienated from it. I'm like, you know, shame on you, because the stakes are high. Davis Simon, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You've been watching Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll see you next time.